Welcome to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast, where we inspire women by teaching applicable skills and tools and assisting them with connecting with one another, healing, and aspiring to their highest selves so they can reach their full potential. Thank you so much for joining us. It's such an honor to be with you, and I'm so grateful we have Dr. Madsen with us today. And I'm really excited to introduce her to you. So, um, Dr. Susan R. Madsen is the Karen Height Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. She is also the founding director of the Utah Women and Leadership Project, which focuses on the strengthening the strengthening the impact of Utah girls and women through increasing college completion rates and helping women and girls find their voice and become leaders. Professor Madsen and her team have written many Utah research and policy briefs, research snapshots, impact reports, newspaper editorials, and other resources. They host 20 to 30 events each year to support the mission of their work. Susan is also a well-known global scholar, authoring or editing eight books and publishing hundreds of articles, chapters, and reports. Madsen's research has been featured in the U.S. News and World Report, The Atlantic, The New York Times, Parenting Magazine, Chronicle of Higher Education, The Washington Post, and she is a regular contributor to Forbes. She is a well-known speaker in local, national, and international settings. For example, she has presented at the New York Times, Argentina Parliament Palace, um, and NGO sessions at the United Nations. She serves on or advises many nonprofit community and educational boards and committees, including the Utah Governor of Utah Roadmap, Real Women Run, Silicon Slopes, Envision Utah, United Way of Utah County, South Davis County Communities That Care, Utah Financial Empowerment Coalition, Utah Women's Coalition, Better Days 2020, KUER Radio, and more. Dr. Madsen received a bachelor's degree from BYU, a master's from Portland State, and a doctorate from the University of Minnesota. She and her husband, Greg, are the proud parents of four adult children and two grandchildren. (laughs) Oh, that's such a, so impressive, and I'm so grateful to have you with us. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. And you got a, you got a hold of a longer bio. Uh, yeah. So, so right. hopefully people are still awake listening, but yes. no, yes. happy, happy to be here chatting with you, Sarah. Absolutely. Okay. So um, today I really thought we could talk about empowering women in education and really talking about some of the barriers that women face in terms of education, as well as employment. Um, So one of the first questions I have for you is what inspired you to do this work? That's a good question. So I about about 14 years ago, it's been 14 years now, I was actually asked by the Commissioner of Higher Education for the state of Utah and also the Governor's Education Excellence Committee to do some research on why more women weren't going to college and graduating in the state of Utah. I had started publishing books on research that I had been doing globally and internationally on understanding the lifetime journeys of preparing to lead. So a piece of that I started speaking on was about how important the college experience was for these women governors, for these women university presidents, for these CEOs around the country, how how critical that college experience was. So people heard me talk and they said, hey, you like girls and women. Uh, can you do some research around the state of Utah to help us really understand that? Why more women weren't going to returning and completing college? So I started that 14 years ago, it was supposed to be a one-year project. And then I said, this is really good research, so let's do two years. And then I've never been able to pull myself away. I have to say, I just feel very called to do this work. Um, And and for me, I'm a spiritual, religious person. I've published on 
calling. I'm putting my fingers in quote marks here. Um, and, and not everybody that feels called has to be spiritual or religious. You know, you just feel like you're made to do certain things. And so that's what's connected with me. And because of the needs and the requests and things that continue to come in, um, I, I've stayed with it. And it, it really is the foundation. Research is the foundation to lead to really good social change. And that's what we need, particularly in the state of Utah. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It sounds like you identified this as your life purpose and you're creating so much change in the community. And so- Thank you. Um, yeah. And so one of the questions that I have is, um, what are some of the barriers that women face to completing education? And let's, yeah, let's start there. So, yeah, we we identified when we did this research years and years ago, we really identified many of the barriers. Some of them go with different people, you know, different states across the country. But in Utah, we, we have a more exaggerated. So anything that we have struggles with girls and women in the state, you find those same things across the country. But in more conservative and religious cultures, they are exaggerated, like like we know there's a wage gap around the country, right? But in Utah, we're the worst <laughs> of any, any other state. And so the same thing applies for women in education in terms of barriers. For women in Utah, it's, you know, there's always women every place have that struggle between life, family, work, all of those things that women uh, challenge and in Utah it's even more, and it's even more in Utah before women marry and have children, because particularly if you're a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints, you tend to hear those beliefs that you're going to be a stay at home mom, and so oftentimes, and if you've read the book Lean In uh, by Sandberg, Cheryl Sandberg, you get this that that oftentimes you plan your education around like the. Even if you're not married, even if you don't even know if you're going to get married for sure, um, you plan. And so your aspirations are different. And so there's often lower aspirations. We have a culture. It's changing. But we have had a culture. And we I saw that so strong, uh, you know, 13, 14 years ago when we started the research that, that we're just... I'm putting Justin, air quotes, just going to be a mom with still that information that you don't need to graduate if you're, if you're going to be a mom. And what we know from the research is that's absolutely false. You need, um, and, and in my religion, that's outlined. You need, even, even if you're not going to work for pay, which is super unusual, there's very few women that don't work for pay in their adult years. You still need an education to benefit your kids. I mean, the research around more educated parents read more often to their kids. They're more prepared, they prepare their children better for, for education and math and reading and all of those things. So, so that um, is a barrier. Those are a few barriers, but of course, we have some really recent uh, research on. Uh, we pulled data from Envision Utah. They shared their data with us with like four, or I think it was six to 9,000 high school students. And then we ran data on gender. And what was fascinating is that women in high school are already significantly more concerned about money than our okay. young men. So that financial piece is really stronger in we worry about it more as young women. So that financial piece is, is critical. We in Utah, often we're changing, starting to change, but we don't as parents, we think back to when we went to college. We were tough. We earned it all. We did all of our work. We, we know our parents didn't help us pay for college. Guess what? That doesn't work so good. Yeah, and when when my college students work uh, more than twenty hours a week, which many of them do, it it it's the research is clear they don't do they don't learn as much in college they don't work as but we still have that mentality in Utah of, I shouldn't have to save up money for my kids' educational experience when in most states that's just not true so that finance is really quite uh, we don't want kids getting out with huge amounts of debt especially for a bachelor's degree. And then I'll say one other quick thing. 
is that even though in Utah, the uh, we're shifting in terms of the expectations that more women now, since I started the research, are thinking that a bachelor's degree is important. We do rank as the worst state in the nation for the gap between men and women. We have the biggest gap between men and women getting graduate degrees. So there's not aspirations. And guess what? So many things like you, what you do, Sarah, take at least a master's degree. And so we just have, um, we really don't have as many women aspiring. So that's one thing I really found in my early, you know, found in my early research is that we didn't have those aspirations. If you're not going to aspire to go to college, you're not going to go to college. Right. If you're not going to aspire to lead and use your voice, you're not going to prepare yourself. And so I'm saying we have to start with girls and young women to raise those aspirations. And in, in high school, earlier on, where we can talk to women about education, it's so empowering with all of the cultural factors that we face with body image and yes. negative beliefs about who we have to be and how we should how we should look and how we should behave that are creating a lot of cultural uh, and social problems. Yeah, absolutely. There's such a, such pressure, even though religiously we teach the opposite, there's such pressure in Utah. We know this from higher cosmetic surgery rates. We know this from, from other things as well. Um, that, that, that external appearance, not that internal worth, but that yeah. external appearance is so important. And one of the, when you look at the psychology of religion and some different research, one of those is, is the pressure, you know, that, that people want, you know, to, to get married. Um, and I, and we, and I do feel like marriage is what we want to do. Uh, there's so much research around the impact of good, healthy relationships, married on your children and so forth. But when it comes down to, you know, that pressure, somehow people get in their minds that, that looking for a mate is all about how they look on the outside. And right. not that internal. I think boys get that pressure and back and forth. So there's some interesting dynamics, uh, Sarah, that we have to wrestle with Absolutely. on how to change that. To me, really focusing on our minds and what's inside of us and our hearts and how smart we, you know, getting smarter is the most important thing. And um, yet there's some some things that are Social media is one of them, like you said, that are impacting that physical appearance as of higher worth than our internal, uh, right? who we are. You know, that's interesting what you brought up about aspiring. I remember in high school, knowing that I was going to get an education and knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of emphasis in my family about education, nor in my cultural group or even religious background. Um, so I am really curious. I think that is critical. Talking with women about their dreams, their goals, and then supporting them with finding applicable ways to apply those and setting, setting them up for success. But one thing I'm really curious about is where you talked about Utah is the worst. Because we know there's other places in the world that are that also have, you know, um, you know, religious backgrounds and things yeah. like that. So I am curious about why why in Utah um, is it is it worse or more severe? I think you can find some similar trends among among uh, other countries. So so let me just tell you real quick about a study that came out that was really good, well done a couple of years ago, published in a great journal. Um, and it looked at what's called what we call religiosity and wow. the wage gap. So um, and what it found uh, and is that in every society, so they did two studies. One, they compared each state to each other, like all the, you know, States in the United States, and then they did it by countries. And then they took religiosity, like how, you know, on a scale, um, how religious is this area or this country? And in every case, 
around the world, more religious and conservative society, more religious societies are conservative. And in those cases, there was a worse wage gap. So they found that that, of course, related to somewhat fertility rate, but even more when you have more religious societies, you have less women in power and especially political power. And that changes. You have less women in leadership. You just uh, when you have religious societies, you just have more men controlling and more men with power. And so, and then the last one is the one that connects with what you said, and that in more religious societies, there's more sexual objectification. Yeah. And so yeah. that relates to pornography rates, but that relates to cosmetic surgery, plastic surgery, body image issues, those kinds of things. So in general, I mean, when I say we're, we're actually ranked as the worst state for women's equality, and that is a certain number of things. I think we have a wonderful state for many things, but there, there are things we need to change. Right now, we, are the, we have the widest gap in the nation for the wage right. gap and other things as well, right? The educational level and, and women starting businesses. Uh, we're not the worst on that, but we're ranking lower. But one thing you'd find interesting, Sarah, is we, we are 43rd in the nation and places like Mississippi and Louisiana are with, with us um, in terms of math, eighth grade math scores between like boys do a lot better than girls in the state of Utah on even their eighth grade math scores. And you might think that you listeners, what does that have to do with anything? Well, it tells us it's not how smart because there's other states with no gap. There's other countries with no gap. And so socialization is really strong in quote, what a man's role is and what a woman's role is, what girls should act like, what boys should do, what they should aspire to. And so I push back sometimes and say, say, if, you know, why do we have so few women going into STEM areas? Well, if you don't even think that that's an option for you, then do you really have a choice? Then can you right. truly aspire? Right. You know, and, and some of those are the best family friendly kinds of opportunities. So, so there's this wrestle between, um, you know, some people with the wage gap blame women. Well, they need to know negotiate more or whatever. They're, it's really complex. You just need to, we're socialized not to do certain things that we have limited, we have constraints, right? And yeah. so all of those things, I'm all over the place, Sarah, but all of those no, it's great. It's a great conversation. Really come into play when we're raising girls and when we hear messages that, oh, this is not your role and this is the role of men or whatever. And we're still seeing that in our society today when in reality, there are so many more choices. And, and I want to value women who choose to stay at home. That's a big choice. But, right. but you still need education to, to, to do that. Right. Because if at some time you go through divorce or if you end up, your partner passes away, you want to have something that you can lean on. Yeah. Um, and I but, think it's more than that, Sarah. I think it's, it's you know, we, we say, particularly in my religion, it's something to fall back on. But what we know is, and and Paige Holland, who used to be the first later lady of Utah Valley University, used to say, and actually Abby Cox says that this too, and she's the first lady of the state, um, that they use their education, their bachelor's degrees every single day in community, oh, yeah. in their kids. Yeah. And so, so, but it's Absolutely. all part of that big big bucket of being prepared. I think if we're really self-reliant as families, if we have two parents in the home, they both need to be. You just don't know. Life happens, right? right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you've already commented on this um, quite a bit, but I wondered if we could talk about it for a little bit. Um, so I'm curious about what your thoughts are about how religion can impact culture. And when I say this, I want to hold space I recognize religion. Um, I'm religious too. I'm very spiritual, very close to my heart. But I also understand that oftentimes there are some 
cultural mes- messages that can be very harmful yeah. um, as well. And so I wonder, you've mentioned, you know, already a few of those, but I'm wondering if you have any other thoughts either about the research or what you've found in yeah. your work. Awesome. So one of the things, so I, I have a book specifically last year that came out called The Future Only God Can See If You're, and it's specific for Latter-day Saint. Um, really focused on teen and young adult women, but good for women of all ages, and really wrestled through some of these these kinds of things. I'll, the first one that comes to mind, though, is that, um, you know, we have such an either or mentality, like I can do this or I can do this instead of and. And so what comes up for me is um, just even finishing college. Well, I'm going to college now and when I, but when I have my first baby, then I'm going to drop out. I can't like keep in my space that maybe I can go online or take a class or two at the same time. Um, And so that either or mentality that we're often socialized into, I think can be really harmful. Like if you're a mom, you can't be a leader. That came out in in a couple of studies. If you're a mom, then you can't run for public office or you're not a good mom. Those either or that, uh, you know, that's really dangerous. Another thing that relates to that is I really think, and I have a whole chapter in this book on calling and purpose. So you and I both use that that term. Yeah, I love so that. So oftentimes people feel like, well, my life calling is to mother. I call it mother and um to, you know, mothering or mother, because you can, you know, all all women aren't mothers, but they mother, right? To mother. That's my calling. That's what we're taught sometimes. That's the messages. I I if you look deeper and I quote many of the church leaders, you know, in, in these comments. And actually the doctrine is, is not necessarily that. Um, so right. I, it is that, that women need to, I mean, more talk about run for a public office and get engaged in the community and do things. So I would push back on, we have one, we have more than one calling. And for me, a mother and a grandmother is one of my callings. And not or, <laughs> and I'm also called to, and whether it's spiritual, religious or not, I mean, whatever, I'm using that word for everybody. I am, and you are, and anyone, we're called to prepare to use our head, heart, and hands in other ways too. So it's not or, it's and. And so for me, I mean, Oh my gosh, I've I knew I've just walked through my life doing what I believe God is to asking me and to and has prepared me to do. And I'm so grateful that I kept going with my education to prepare myself to be able to. Now, oftentimes we say women need to learn how to say no. I say the power is in the yes. When you're prepared and you can step forward and say, Yes, I am prepared, I can use my voice, I can use my head. I can use my hands to do the work that that if for me God needs me to do, but in society that society needs. You know, where are those gaps? And man, do we have a lot of gaps in this world today? In Utah, in in outside of Utah, we have a lot of gaps. And so I know I've spent some time on that, but I really want to emphasize that for your listeners, Sarah, that um that sense of calling. Yes, mother is one, but uh, and there are other things. And so there's a lot of depression out there for people that that think that's their only. Like, so what do I do now for the next 20, 30, 40 years after my kids are out of the house? And maybe they're like me. They don't, we don't love domestic duties. I don't right. love the housework and stuff that brings like no fulfillment for me. And so I really wish I had more fulfillment in that area. But, oh my gosh, when I get women that come to me and say, you know, I'm not prepared to lead or whatever, I ask them, now, haven't you led the women's organization in your church? Haven't you raised four teenagers? I mean, is that not leadership? Are you not ready to lean in and use your voice in ways that can change lives around you? Not not just your own kids. That's important, right? And your family. 
But there are so there is so much of a need today for women who then take all the stuff that they've been learning throughout their lives in college and raising kids and and serving and and then shift it into that amazing last um, couple of phases in life where they can can um, really do remarkable things to help others in ways that maybe they didn't imagine. Right. Yeah. And that's one thing I appreciate about my education is I think it encourages, encourages you to go inward to identify what are your desires? What are your dreams? What do you want to do with your education? You start to look at the possibilities. And that's one thing that I feel that we want to advocate for more of is women being able to tap into their own internal voice, their own internal sense of identity and who they are. And that's where it feels like it's getting lost. I can't tell you how many women come into my office and feel very stuck in perfectionism, Uh feel very stuck in, um, you know, even in power and control in their relationship. We know that Utah is we're we're very high in terms of domestic violence yeah. and sexual assault and, and so child all- sexual abuse i talk about that too the three together child sexual abuse domestic violence and sexual assault yep yeah. and that happens there are just so you know i mean that happens in more religious cultures you would think yes. it would be the opposite but anytime you have a power dynamic That's greater and really obvious between men and women. And in our culture, we do. Men are public. Men have the power. You look at our legislature. um, But that that comes into the home. And so when you have that more, just pretty much any religious culture, you're going to have higher levels. It would seem the opposite um, to most people, but no, it's not. Yeah, it's very unfortunate because I know spirituality um, and religion can be so supportive in other ways. And I hope that we can have more conversations around this. There seems to be a lot of discomfort with hard conversations in talking about um, sometimes in religious settings, abuse and domestic violence and what you should do if you're in those situations. And so I, I really hope that we can advocate for change. Um, One of my questions for you is, what are some things that we can do as a community to start advocating for more change for women and supporting them in the workforce, but also becoming leaders and really learning to tap into what their dreams, what their goals are in making a difference? Yeah, I think the first thing is, I mean, I was just, just yesterday giving a couple of speeches and one group it was up in box elder county in the in the state of utah and i i loved loved it but many people came up to me after and said i had no idea about these statistics i i i'm just living in happy valley they weren't in utah county but they were like <laughs> like just kind of hanging out and i the number one thing for those listening i mean the more you get information, the more you can do something. I mean, if you don't know what's happening, if you think you're the only one that's being abused, if you think you're the only one that's feeling all of these things, there's actually so much, so many people that feel the same. So reach out. I mean, uh, I I run the, as, as you said, Sarah, the Utah Women and Leadership Project, we have about 30 thousand who get my monthly email and they're people from Europe and people sign up all over the world because they speak in different countries. And so we have reports on things like our newest one was on eating disorders and what, how Utah ranks. Um, But picking up the reports or listening to, to, you know, panels or whatever, we link to lots of resources. So raise our awareness And we cannot be silent any longer if we really, really love people around us. If we love our families, if we love, you know, and want to help change, we cannot hide this. We have been silent for too long on child sexual abuse, domestic violence, and sexual assault. And it is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And I would say as a religious person, it is unacceptable to God. 
Um, it really? is not, I mean, I say when I speak about child sexual abuse, why are we not moving heaven and earth to protect our children? And that is what is expected by God. So I know this is not a religious thing, but you're getting religion from me because it's on my mind a lot. And it relates to cult and it relates to our culture. Well, I really appreciate this discussion because I think it's critical in talking about how religion does impact culture. And just like you talked about, the women and children that are suffering um, and not getting the help and resources they need. And sometimes even um, when they share it, um, it's not addressed. It, right? it isn't. And it's not. And there's work with, with law enforcement and so forth. And I do want to acknowledge there are men that actually, you know, suffer from domestic violence and stuff. That percentage, Absolutely. of course, is significantly Absolutely. less. But I want to acknowledge that it's 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 there. Just, just yes. so I, I feel for men that that um, that struggle with this as well. Just in the last probably three months, I visited now four um, of our shelters in the state of Utah. Our shelters. Um, uh, was just up in in Logan last week visiting a shelter, um, uh, domestic violence, sexual assault, all of these things uh, called CAPSA, and uh, then really looked at uh, other ones and just really getting the feel for some of the services in the state of Utah. There are services. We haven't done what we've needed to, but there's good legislation out there right now, hopefully, that will move through our legislature to really, as a state, start taking it more seriously. And I love that Governor Cox and and Lieutenant Governor Henderson are speaking out about this as well. It's in the news almost every day now, right? And in a year to two years ago, not, not. Right. Yeah, I'm grateful that we're seeing some change in that aspect. Um, you know, the other thing that I was thinking is how important it is to find mentors and women who can support you in your education as well, because with all of these um cultural messages, we really need other women to look to, to really create this change. Yeah, absolutely. So one, one quick thing about that, um, that, and I just gave this advice yesterday in one of my speeches, so it's on my mind. Um, We do need to, you know, find mentors and there's some good programs for younger women and other groups starting to put together programs and so forth. But my biggest piece of advice is this. If you see someone in, around you, in in if you're in the workforce and working with someone, or you're in a church setting as as a teenager or a young uh, adult, and you see see a woman that uh, really would be a great mentor, I always recommend this: don't go up and say, "I I need your mentoring." Mm. That's not. I have hundreds every month do that honestly to me and i just can't 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 do that but the the key is put yourself in a situation where you serve you like if you're in the workplace volunteer to be on a committee where you get to interact with those people and you serve i mean you help volunteer to help do whatever put yourself in a situation where where you help and when you help and connect then that's that's when I spend time mentoring is because yeah. it's 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 reciprocal. It's not yeah. just give me, give me, give me. And that's the mistake I think uh, many women do. Just like, can you spend time with me? Can you help me? Well, what can you do to get get yourself on the radar of that person? Give yeah. and in the process of giving and working on planning events or whatever you're going to be doing together then you get this informal mentoring that can really be helpful. So that's my big pitch on mentoring. I love that. Well, um, just as we're closing up, I'm wondering if there's anything else you'd like to mention in terms of what someone can do if, you know, they're trying to decide on whether to get an education or how, if someone's wanting to get more involved in the community, what are, what are some things that you would suggest? I love that. So first of all, no brainer. Every single person needs advanced education. You need to graduate from high school, I should say, and then advanced education. Um, Sometimes people go the route of trade schools, and I think that's a good start uh, for some people. Um, um, 
you know, to, to hit some of those, but I would say that's, that's not the full education. Um, you can start with that, but then there's, um, you know, one, two, three, and f- four, one, two, four, and more. So one, sometimes one year certificates can go into an associate's and then you continue and then go into a, a bachelor's and then more after that. So, so really plan to go to education, start saving, Money, having your kids save money. I found that in my research that kids that saved their own money and parents were saving money actually were more likely to graduate from college when they started, even in kindergarten. So you start thinking about it. You start thinking about it all the way up. So so I would say no-brainer education and then continue that education. I would say to mothers who are listening in, um, don't feel bad if you didn't finish your education. Although mentioning that to your daughters, how you wished you would have gotten more earlier does help. Your daughters thrive on education, but I would say jump back in. I mean, jump back in one class at a time, someplace now, <laughs> just start. Don't say, well, when my kids are all out of school, you can jump in to a class now, online, whatever. Just start back. Um, it changes your confidence. It changes. It's very scary for women right at the first, right, to go in, but do that. Um, And and push yourself to aspire beyond what you were socialized to do. Because don't, I mean, think about the messages you're getting. Be really thoughtful on those, but go back to understand. I have a whole chapter in my book on understanding your gifts, talents, and strengths. They all mean different things, but understand these unique, distinct gifts that you have that are the combination that nobody else on this earth that has ever lived or lived is living now has just like you and, and understand that identity in deeper ways and, and, um, and talk about your gifts and strengths. We're socialized to quote, be humble and not talk about our gifts and strengths, but the research is contrary. Humility just means being teachable. It does not mean being small. It does not. And being able to identify and discuss in good ways, your gifts and strengths helps you to contribute in better ways to this world. Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. Um, One last question that I have for you, and then we'll wrap up, um, is what are some of the resilience factors that the uh, research shows in terms of when women get an education? Yeah, so many, actually, there's so many benefits to women on our website, utwomen.org. If you find our handouts, we have one pagers on all of these. But, you know, everything about self-worth and and all of that is related, actually, to resilience as well. But being able to um, be, you know, that the benefits of education, being lifelong learners helps with that. But being able to critically evaluate Um, understand self-awareness, understand yourself. All of that helps with better coping, better resilience, um, and everybody gets smarter in general. Your even even decisions on on what you purchase are improved typically with education. So there's so many things that that move, you know, and mental health to your area, Sarah. Um, You know, even though mental health is a hard and big area today, um, and there's so many struggles, uh, being able to, education is related to mental health as well. Not saying that the more education, you never have mental health issues, but being able to, to wrestle with self-understanding and, and being aware and reading more about issues around um, mental health, that's, th- those are some of the benefits of having more education. And yeah, like absolutely. I said, don't feel bad, just jump back in. <laughs> yeah, I love that. Well, I just want to thank you so much for taking the time today. This was awesome. Such a great conversation. Thanks so much. It's been great Mm -hmm. chatting with you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for listening to the Heart and Soul Wellness Podcast with your host, Sarah Carter. Make sure to like and subscribe. And if you have any thoughts about what we talked about today, leave a comment. Also, you can find us at heartandsoulwellness.org and on Facebook and Instagram. Join us again as we continue to help women 
heal, connect, and aspire to their true and authentic selves.